very severe phenotype. Uh, this patient will be admitted to the ICU uh, for the special uh, treatment. Uh, we did uh, some of the um, uh, data analysis you know, for the risk factors for ARDS and for the progression uh, from ARDS to uh, death. And we identified old age neutrophilia and organ and coagulation dysfunction, especially in the high ARDS and uh, uh, high D-dimer. Uh, they are the very uh, important uh, parameters to indicate the development of the ARDS also predict the patient's mortality. Uh, the high fever of associated with the high likelihood of ARDS development, but it's a lower likelihood of stays. Um, some other risk factors for severe COVID-19 pneumonia from the Shanghai you know, treatment uh, plan. So as I said, it's at the worst age and the clinical indicator for the deterioration of the COVID-19 pneumonia uh, com uh, comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart disease, obesity, but also progressive worsening of the lung parenchyma, consolidated chains, lymphocytes, uh, decreasing, significantly increase of the serum, hydrogen six levels, and ARDH. Uh, here, this shows dynamic changes, especially, I think, in the D-dimer. Uh, progressive increase in the D-dimer and uh, progressive decreasing of uh, lymph site. We have the very important two uh, predictive uh, factors for mortality, for ARDS. Uh, also, you know, the interleukin seeing interleukin six levels. Uh, in the Wuhan, you know, uh, some of the cases have been treated with interleukin 6 um, neutralizing anybody, but in fact, they only treated one patient. For the treatment of the COVID 19, uh, so we use antiviral drugs, we use a cortical uh, steroid, although it's still controversial. Uh, of course, the support therapy and other uh, treatments like the, the traditional Chinese medicine. For the antiviral drugs, so far, in the, in the Shanghai treatment plan, we focused on the hydroxychloroquine. So we ranked it as the number one drug in the Shanghai plan. For the uh, lopinavir and the uh, monotherapy, uh, is the Lotus China clinical trial. It had been finished and published in the England Journal of Medicine by Professor Paul. And uh, uh, in general, it showed a uh, very similar mortality. Now for the Abidro, uh, the 200 milligrams three times daily, the adults no more uh, for no more for 10 days. And also, uh, alpha interferon has been currently in use for uh, uh, nebulization in the patient. Uh, in uh, alpha or kappa, it's two of the nebulization has been used in Shanghai. So here just shows, you know, the New England Journal uh, uh, paper results showed locally and uh, Ruthen Levy. It showed very similar mortality when just uh, uh, quantify, you know, the mortality at 28 days, so it's very similar. For the corticosteroid, uh, we have some criteria, you know, for the application. So if the test imaging shows a rapid progressive uh, 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 changes the test uh, radio, radiology in the test uh, CT or the test uh, um, just the regular uh, radiology is a progressive, a progressive uh, uh, you know um, uh, increase of the infiltration or the worsening of the oxygenation like you know the saturation more than uh, less than 93 percent a response rate more than 30 or the PF ratio less than 300 so for these cases we use, we use a lower to moderate uh, dose of the uh, st uh, steroid. Uh, of course, you know, um, when the patient receiving steroids, um, we will think about all the uh, contradictions like diabetes, allergy, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, uh, glaucoma, GI bleeding, all these factors. So if there's no uh, major contradictions, the patient meets the criteria, uh, for the um, rapid progressive um, uh, of the disease, so we started using the corticosteroid. So here is uh, some of the data we analyzed. It's, this is the 201 patient uh, data analysis. This is from the uh, Wuhan city. So the data in Shanghai still in under analysis. It shows that um, once the patient developed ARDS and the patient received 
may say or pretty soon the corticosteroid it shows a better outcome. It has a reduced mortality. Uh, so far, we're still working on the detailed uh, um, data analysis for around 300 ARDS patients. The majority of patients are from, still from the Wuhan. Uh, in a preliminary data show that um, some patients have a very good response for uh, corticosteroid. When the lymph size is very low, but once they receive corticosteroid, the patient uh, lymph size, CD4 lymph size, start increasing, and all these patients survive. Uh, here is a, a situation we use uh, corticosteroid ARDS uh, with high CRP and the interleukin 6, the VA pneumonia, blue basic, uh, uh, also chest infiltration. The dose we use at 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram body weight. And also we uh, pay uh, high attention to the CD4 cell count. Uh, every day we check the CD4 cell count after we use um, the corticosteroid. For the supportive uh, therapy, uh, we use the non-invasive ventilation, use the invasive ventilation, and also uh, the final stage we use uh, ECMO. Also, uh, we use um, you know, some other strategies, like um, for the cytokine storm prevention, we use a high dose of vitamin C, and we use uh, anticoagulation therapy. If the d is increased, we use uh, uh, you know, anticoagulation therapy for majority of patients if there's no major uh, contradictions. Uh, Chinese uh, traditional medicine has been used in more than 90% of the patient, especially you know, for the, the patient with a very mild uh, symptom. So we feel that Chinese medicine has some effect, uh, could um, prevent the, the patient developing from mild to moderate and uh, prevent the patient from moderate to severe uh, a clinical phenotype. Uh, ACEI and ARB, you know, it's very controversial. We do not have a confirmed the data whether you know, the patient vaccine develops uh, COVID-19. At the same time, the patient, the hypertension patient, so far we do not have very strong data to support or to um, use or not use ACEI. But so far, if patients you know, still have hypertension, we give the ACEI, we give the ERB. Uh, so it's here it's just so very uh, preliminary. I, I think it's not conclusive. I think uh, I'll just spend a few uh, minutes to talk about very briefly, you know, the diagnosis and the treatment of COVID-19 in Shanghai. So, some of the data, you know, is from the Wuhan city. I have, you know, more than 10 colleagues still working in Wuhan city. So they shared some data with, uh, with me, and I also we published this uh, analyzed data in, 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 uh, in uh, China internal medicine. And I hope you know, this information will be helpful for, you know, for the colleagues, you know, for the attendees uh, tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Song, for this presentation. And on behalf of the participants. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Um, the first question is loss of smell has been uh, reported in the media as an early sign of infection. Is that symptom you've um, observed? And is there any other unique features that you can tell us? Yeah, you know, uh, yesterday, you know, I checked with my colleague, you know, she's still working in an uh, in isolation, uh, isolated hospital in Shanghai. So at the beginning of this COVID-19 in January and February, we do not have too many of the patients, you know, without you know, the losing the sensation for the smelling. But now for the imported case, roughly 10% of these patients complain. So they lose the, uh, the smell sensations, uh, you know, uh, recently. So I think it's a new feature of the COVID-19, especially for the imported case. All right. Any other uh, unique features that you can share with us, or you know, the patients are also complain. You know, um, the majority of the symptom is uh, fever and uh, dry cough, but also uh, roughly around the five to ten percent complain diarrhea as in Shanghai, mm -hmm. okay. as a GI symptom. Okay. Uh, for physicians in your hospital, did you set uh, age limits uh, for faculty? Uh, to work with the ICU with the COVID patients, um, how about pregnant physicians or immune suppressed physicians? 
Yeah, you know, um, um, since you know all the patients treated in uh, Shanghai Public Health uh, Hospital, this is isolated. Uh, it's a special hospital to treat the COVID-19. So we uh, take care of so all the physicians, everybody who enters into the ICU into the regular ward should be fully pr protected. And uh, the mild patient treated in a uh, 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 different place and a very severe patient like, you know, the patient that they need to the ICU individually, one patient to one ICU. And uh, all the physicians, all these, um, uh, the nurses are fully protected. And so far, so we have uh, seven, 1,700 physicians in Wuhan. So they are the physicians from Shanghai, they went to Wuhan. And also around, roughly around the 50, 60 physicians in the Shanghai in the special hospital, none of them got infected. So I think the protection Isolation protection is very important. That's, that's very um, good since in Italy we're having one in 10 people, uh, 10 uh, healthcare provider is affected. So that's really good. So um, have you seen co-infection with the COVID uh, patients uh, with other uh, viral infection like influenza or, or uh, coronavirus? Uh, yes, you know, we find, you know, uh, the influenza B, uh, you know, has been uh, co-infected in some of the patients. Uh, sometimes you know uh, influenza A and influenza B, but also some other you know um, uh, virus in the RPA like you know uh, uh, the renal virus and uh, um, you know, some bacteria. But at least stage you know the bacterial infection is another issue. You know, uh, roughly around uh, you know twenty percent, more than twenty percent. If you get intubated, more than twenty percent get uh, bacterial infection. So how frequent is it that the patients have uh, other viral infections, if you can tell? Uh, not very high, not very high. So basically, you know, majority of the patients, once they, uh, when they receive the nasopharyngeal swab test, at the same time, they also receive the, you know, the test for the influenza A and influenza B. I think it's a very low, very low proportion. Okay, well, that's good. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sang. That was very uh, enlightening and, and uh, you know, good. Thank you for sharing the information with us. Uh, I would like to introduce our next discussion, which is the global pers perspective of the uh, COVID-19 in Hong Kong. And there will be three uh, presenters, um, Dr. Uh, David C.L. Lam, uh, which is a, who is currently a clinical associate professor in the Department of Medicine, University of Hong Kong. He is a respiratory physician uh, with a research commitment, translational research and clinical uh, trials. Um, and his uh, research lab uh, focuses on translational research in lung cancer and AIDS and uh, COPD, sorry. Uh, he is uh, currently in the International Lung Screening uh, Trial uh, Consortium uh, screen, uh, Steering uh, International uh, lung screening study and biomarker research and he also is the APSR uh, secretary general. Um, next is Professor David uh, Xu uh, Jiang Hui. Uh, he is a director of the Stanley Hu Center uh, for uh, Emerging Infections, uh, Infectious Diseases, uh, Jockey Club uh, School of Public Health and uh, Primary Care <laughs> Faculty of Medicine, CUHK. Uh, he is a chairman of the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics at CUHK and is a Stanley Hu Professor uh, of Respiratory Medicine, uh, Department of Medicine and Therapeutics at CUHK. And um, lastly, uh, Dr. Men Hu Li, uh, who is currently uh, president of the CHEST delegation, Hong Kong and uh, Macau. He is a consultant for the Department of Medicine, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital. Hong Kong, and he is also honorary uh, clinical associate professor uh, of uh, Li Ka Shing, uh, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Hong Kong and the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics at Chinese University uh, of Hong Kong. So here's the global perspective of COVID-19 in Hong Kong. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I can see my colleagues, uh, Dr. Li is on the screen. Um, actually, Professor Hui um, is trying hard to ring in, but um, he said he has a problem in um, hearing what we are saying uh, from the audio here. 
So uh, I'm glad that he's um, actually with us. Um, um, if um, without delay, can I start the uh, our presentation first? With um, I would like to take this uh, the few more minutes to show you um, the COVID-19 situation in uh, Hong Kong. Um, actually, we have the first case actually imported um, into Hong Kong when uh, one of the residents in Wuhan in China arrived in Hong Kong and um, that first patient was actually referred and managed at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hong Kong. And actually you can see from the graph, indeed, um, we have been having a quite low number of cases confirmed in Hong Kong over the past two months until in the recent one, two weeks that you can see on the right hand, right hand side of the slides that um, the cases actually um, climbed up very quickly in the recent um, two weeks as a result of um, people uh, returning from overseas. And um, uh, actually you can see from the uh, numbers we have listed, um, actually in these two days, the numbers of confirmed cases has climbed up to more than 500. And uh, most of them has got travel history. So um, uh, actually they're uh, bringing in uh, from overseas those um, cases. And um, fortunately, only four of them died and um, a significant proportion of them, more than 100, got recovered and discharged. And um, Actually, 21 of them were actually ever in a critical or serious condition. And um, interestingly, we have a about um, slightly less than one tenth of the case being asymptomatic cases. Next, can I have the next slide, please? Yes. Um, we would say over our experience in Hong Kong, we found that these cases have got a short incubation period, but at the same time, they could carry a high viral load. And um, there's the cases, the confirmed cases, a lot of them got long virus shedding period. And uh, also, and also um, the, um, there is, um, we found that there could be a rapid person-to-person -person transmission. And uh, some cases could indeed be asymptomatic or only have very mild symptomatic um, at the beginning. And um, over our experience in Hong Kong, we noted that indeed um, lots of the cases comes from what we call clusters. Initially, we have the clues cluster from the diamond clues. And then locally, we have found some family uh, confirmed cases from family gathering, just like those patients um, within the same family gathering sharing hot pots. And um, some clusters were identified from um, temple attendants that they go to um, um, worship and um, at the weekend and gathered together and then got the um, diagnosis. And recently we have uh, some clusters coming up um, that have um, popped attendance and also um, the music band player um, actually inside the, the pub. And uh, interestingly, um, in two of the confirmed patients, we also tested their dogs and um, they were tested positive. Next, please. And um, the cases that we have seen are mostly mild and um, they have very mild respiratory symptoms and fever, and some of them even asymptomatic. And um, the chest X-ray and CT scans, as you can see from the slides here, initially could be quite clear or very subtle non-specific pneumonic changes. And um, fortunately, a lot of them recovered um, quite well. Uh, next, please. So um, the, um, the viral load actually detected in, um, could be detected in asymptomatic patient. And indeed, the um, viral load and shedding of uh, confirmed cases um, for those asymptomatic ones could be quite similar to those patients who are symptomatic. Next, please. 
And um, over here in Hong Kong, we mainly use the triple therapy to treat the patients that consist of the protease inhibitor, lopinavir, and also the ritonavir, together with um, ribavirin. And um, we have also tried the interferon beta-1 beta if the illness onset um, is actually before seven days of the um, viral strutting. And um, a randomized controlled trial comparing triple therapy and two of the agents inside the triple therapy had been completed. We are waiting for the results locally. And we understand that remdesivir is actually in clinical trial. And um, uh, we have considered hydroxychloroquine, but it's not in routine use. And uh, probably we believe that um, it is of um, immunomodulatory effects, although it's not of a significant uh, uh, antiviral action in the South. Next, please. And um, so the measures we have adopted in Hong Kong is mainly a containment one. And we have what we have done here over the past two months is actually tried our best to rapidly isolate the suspected or confirmed cases with quarantine close contact. And we uh, have canceled mass a gathering thanks events. Thanks to Nicole Allen, Eileen Larson, and Christina Bronze. And from APSR, Rina Kish Kishigumi. And before we begin, um, I'd like to give a few notes and reminders. And if we could go to the second slide. Um, so first of all, we've asked each of the representatives of each region to prepare 10 minutes of remarks to allow time for questions. One, we have muted all of the participants' lines due to the large number of registrants. If you have a question, we encourage you to submit it via the chat feature on the webinar and we will be developing a frequently asked questions document after the webinar, and our participants have agreed to help uh, facilitate those answers. At the end of the, of the seminar, please complete a brief evaluation at the end to help us identify future topics. And please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all registrants tomorrow. The archived webinar will also be posted on the ATS website, and feel free to share the link with your colleagues. So if I can have the next slide. Okay, so the aim of tonight's webinar, which we plan to schedule as a series, is to allow respiratory health professionals in different regions to share their experiences with the COVID-19 so far and have an opportunity to ask their colleagues in other regions questions. This webinar will include practitioners and professors from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Korea. And with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's first speaker, Dr. Wan Lin Song. Dr. Song is a professor and researcher at the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, Zhongshan Hospital, Hudan University. He's the chair of the department and associated director of Shanghai Respiratory Research Institute. He is also the elected director of Shanghai Thoracic of the Thoracic of the Shanghai Thoracic Society and he is head of the APSR Respiratory Infections Non-TB Assembly. So his topic, um, uh, I'll go ahead and hand this over to Dr. Song. Hi, uh, thank you, David, for the introduction. I also thank um, APSR and the ATS for organization of this um, uh, webinar. So I'm like you know, to um, share the experience of anti-COVID-19 in Shanghai. Could you upload my slides? Um, just opening my slides. Perfect. So here I just want to briefly you know, talk about you know, the Tonghe experience against the COVID-19 you know, the diagnosis and the management. So it's known you know, that COVID-19 has been spreading faster in the past two months. So here is a data, you know, up to um, March uh, 19. So I think it's a global issue now. So uh, by the data of March 21st, you know, so far it says around 400 cases have been diagnosed and treated in Shanghai. Uh, more than 83% have been cured and the mortality around 1%. And the majority of the cases recently reported with the imported cases, more than 50 now. And uh, 
majority of these cases has very mild symptoms. So later I will talk about a little bit in the detail. So the diagnostic criteria. Again, you know, um, I'd like to give a few notes and reminders. And if we could go to the second slide. Um, so first of all, we've asked each of the representatives of each region to prepare 10 minutes of remarks to allow time for questions. One, we have muted all of the participants' lines due to the large number of registrants. If you have a question, we encourage you to submit it via the chat feature on the webinar, and we will be developing a frequently asked questions document after the webinar, and our participants have agreed to help uh, facilitate those answers. At the end of the, of the seminar, please complete a brief evaluation at the end to help us identify future topics. And please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all registrants tomorrow. The archived webinar will also be posted on the ATS website and feel free to share the link with your colleagues. So if I can have the next slide. Okay, so the aim of tonight's webinar, which we plan to schedule as a series, is to allow respiratory health professionals in different regions to share their experiences with the COVID-19 so far and have an opportunity to ask their colleagues in other regions questions. This webinar will include practitioners and professors from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Korea. And with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's first speaker, Dr. Wan Lin Song. Dr. Song is a professor and researcher at the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, Zhongshan Hospital, Wudan University, He's the chair of the department and associated director of Shanghai Respiratory Research Institute. He is also the elected director of Shanghai Thoracic of the Thoracic of the Shanghai Thoracic Society, and he is head of the APSR Respiratory Infections Non-TB Assembly. So his topic, um, um, I'll go ahead and hand this over to Dr. Song. Hi, uh, thank you, David, for the introduction. I also thank. Um, APS and the ATS for organization of this um, uh, webinar. So I'm like you know to um, share the experience of anti COVID 19 in Shanghai. Could you upload my slides? Um, just opening my slides. So here I just want to briefly you know, talk about you know, the Fang experience against the COVID-19, you know, the diagnosis and the management. So it's known you know, that COVID-19 has been spreading you know, faster in the past two months. So here is a data you know, up to um, March uh, 19. So I think it's a global issue now. So uh, by the data of March 21st, you know, so far there is around 400 cases have been diagnosed and treated in Shanghai. Uh, more than 83% have been cu cured and the mortality around 1%. And the majority of the cases recently reported uh, imported cases is more than uh, 50 now. And the uh, majority of these cases has very mild symptoms. So later I will talk about a little bit in the detail. So the diagnostic criteria, you know, for the cases in, in Shanghai, so we follow the guidelines, the national guidelines. This included, you know, the clinical manifestation, uh, uh, epidemiological history, and clinical manifestation. So it's um, a combination of the epidemiology um, data plus uh, laboratory results plus uh, the clinical symptom. Uh, additionally, the test CT is very important. Sometimes, if some area do not have, you know, the nuclear acid the detection assay, the test CT has been set one of the major screening criteria. The confirmed case is a suspect, suspected case plus the positive uh, detection of nuclear acid, either from RT-PCR or from uh, next generation 60 sequencing. So here is some uh, important strategy for suspected cases. We think it's very important, especially at the early uh, beginning of the uh, uh, pandemic. So the clinical suspected cases need to be treated uh, like a confirmed patient, especially in the isolation. 
But sometimes, you know, there's a false negative result from the nasopharyngeal uh, swab test. So it's uh, a very high uh, positive rate from lower ARV secretion samples like the valve or the lower ARV uh, secretion like the sputum. So sometimes we find, you know, it's a false negative result from the nasopharyngeal swab test. But if the test CT plus the epidemiology and the clinical data highly suggest the patient could be a COVID-19 patient, we really isolate the patient in, in our hospital and treat them just like confirmed case. Uh, you know, the severity of the illness uh, depends on the um, uh, oxygen saturation and also uh, some other uh, physiological, uh, physiological uh, parameters. So if the test CT scanning should rapid progress in more than 50% within 24 to 48 hours, and it's a worsening of the oxygenation, uh, at least in you know, this uh, three criteria meet one of the criteria, we have a class by the patient as a severe uh, phenotype or very severe phenotype. And this patient will be admitted to ICU uh, for the special uh, treatment. Uh, we did uh, some of the um, uh, data analysis you know, for the risk factors for ARDS and for the progression uh, from ARDS to uh, death. And we identified old age neutrophilia and organ and coagulation dysfunction, especially in the high ARDS and uh, high D dimer. Uh, they are the very uh, important uh, parameters to indicate the development of the ARDS, also predict the patient's mortality. Uh, the high fever of associated with the high likelihood of ARDS development, but it's a lower likelihood of stress. Um, some other risk factors for severe COVID-19 pneumonia from the Shanghai you know, treatment uh, plan. So as I said, it's at the worst age and the clinical indicator for the deterioration of the COVID-19 pneumonia uh, com uh, comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart disease, obesity, but also progressive worsening of the lung parenchyma, has already changed lymphocytes, uh, decreasing, significantly increased the serum, increasing six levels, and ARDH. Uh, here, this shows dynamic changes, especially, I think, in the D-dimer. Uh, progressive increase in the D-dimer and uh, progressive decreasing of uh, lymphocyte. We have very important two uh, predictive uh, factors for mortality, for ARDS, and uh, also you know, the interleukin seeing interleukin six levels. Uh, in the Wuhan, you know, as some of the cases have been treated with interleukin six um, neutralizing anybody, but in Shanghai, we only treat one patient. For the treatment of the COVID 19, so we use antiviral drugs, we use a clinical steroid, although it's still controversial. Uh, of course, the support therapy and other uh, treatments like the, the traditional Chinese medicine. For the antiviral drugs, so far in the, in the Shanghai treatment plan, we focused on the hydroxychloroquine. So we ranked it as the number one drug in the Shanghai plan. For the uh, lopinavir and the uh, monotherapy, uh, is the lotus China clinical trial. It had been finished and published in the England Journal medicine by Professor Paul. And uh, uh, in general, it shows a uh, very similar mortality. Now for the Abidrol, uh, 200 milligrams three times daily, the so adults no more uh, for uh, no more for 10 days. And also uh, alpha interferon has been currently in use for uh, uh, nebulization in the patient. Uh, in alpha or Kappa, which two of the nebulization has been used in Shanghai. So here just shows, you know, the New England Journal uh, uh, paper result showed looking and uh, Ruth and Levy. It showed very similar mortality when just uh, uh, quantify, you know, the mortality at 28 days, which is very similar. For the corticosteroid, uh, we have some criteria, you know, for the application. So if the test imaging shows a rapid progressive uh, 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 changes, the test radiology, the test uh, CT or the test uh, um, the regular radiology is a progressive, uh, you know, um, 
uh, increase of the infiltration or the worse any of the oxygenation, like you know, the saturation more than uh, less than 93 percent, a response rate more than 30, or the PF ratio less than 300. So for these cases, we use we use a lower to moderate uh, dose of the uh, uh, steroid. Uh, of course, you know um, when the patient receiving steroids, um, we will think about all the uh, contradictions like diabetes, allergy, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, uh, glaucoma, GI bleeding, all these factors. So if there's no uh, major contradictions, the patient meets the criteria uh, for the um, rapid progressive um, uh, of the disease. So we start using the critical steroid. So here is uh, some of the data we analyze. It's, it is, it's the 201 patient uh, data analysis. This is from the uh, Wuhan city. So the data in Shanghai still in under uh, analysis. It shows that um, once the patient developed ARDS and the patient received uh, uh, mesoprednisone, meso the corticosteroid, it shows a better outcome. It has a reduced mortality. Uh, so far, we're still working on the detailed uh, um, data analysis for around 300 ARDS patients. That's the majority of patients are from, are still from the Wuhan. Uh, in a preliminary data show that um, some patients have a very good response for uh, corticosteroid. When the lymph size is very low, but once they re receive corticosteroid, the patient uh, lymph size, CD4 lymph size, starts increasing and all these patients survived. Uh, here is a, a situation we use uh, corticosteroid ARDS with high CRP and interleukin 6, severe pneumonia, progressive. Uh, 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 of the chest uh, infiltration, the dose we used one to two milligrams per kilogram body weight. And also we uh, pay uh, high attention to the CD4 cell count. Uh, every day we check the CD4 cell count after we use um, the corticosteroid. For the supportive uh, therapy, uh, we use the non-invasive ventilation, use the invasive ventilation, and also uh, the final stage we use the uh, ECMO. Also, uh, we use um, you know, some other strategies, like um, for the such kind of storm prevention, we use a high dose of vitamin C, and we use uh, anticoagulation therapy. If the d is increased, we use uh, uh, you know, anticoagulation therapy for majority of the patients if there's no major uh, contradictions. Uh, Chinese uh, traditional medicine has been used in more than 90% of the patient, especially you know, for the, the patient with a very mild uh, symptom. So we feel the Chinese medicine has some effect, uh, could um, prevent the, the patient developing from mild to moderate and uh, prevent the patient from moderate to severe uh, clinical phenotype. Uh, ACEI and ARB, you know, a, it's a very controversial. We do not have a confirmed data whether in the patient who actually developed uh, COVID-19. At the same time, the patient, the hypertension patient, so far we do not have very strong data to support or to um, use or not to use ACEI. But so far, if patients you know, still have hypertension, we give the ACEI, we give the ERB. Uh, so it's here it's just so very uh, preliminary data. I, I think it's not conclusive. conclusive. I think uh, I'll just spend a few uh, minutes to talk about very briefly, you know, the diagnosis and the treatment of COVID-19 in Shanghai. So some of the data, you know, is from the Wuhan city. I have, you know, more than 10 colleagues still working in the Wuhan city. So they shared some data with, uh, with me, and I also we published this uh, analyzed data you know, in, in the in Trauma internal medicine, and I hope you know, this information will be helpful for you know for the colleagues you know for the attendees uh, tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Song, for this presentation. And on behalf of the participants, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Um, the first question is: Loss of smell has been uh, reported in the media as an early sign of infection. Is that symptom you've um, observed, and is there any other unique features that you can tell us? 
Yeah, you know, uh, yesterday, you know, I checked with my colleague, and you know, she's still working in an uh, in isolation, uh, isolated hospital in Shanghai. So at the beginning of this COVID-19 in January and February, we do not have too many of the patients, you know, without you know, the losing the sensation for the remaining. But now for the imported case, roughly 10% of these patients complain. So they lose the, uh, the smell sensations. Uh, you know, uh, recently. So I think it's a new feature of the COVID-19, especially for the imported kids. All right. Any other uh, unique features that you can share with us or? You know, the patients are also complaining, you know, um, the majority of the symptom is uh, fever and uh, dry cough, but also uh, roughly around the five to 10% complain diarrhea as in Shanghai, mm -hmm. as a GI symptom. Okay. Uh, for physicians in your hospital, did you set uh, age limits uh, for faculty uh, to work with the ICU with the COVID patients? Um, how about pregnant physicians or immune suppressed physicians? Yeah, you know, um, um, since you know all the patients treated in uh, Shanghai Public Health uh, Hospital, this is isolated. Uh, it's a special hospital to treat the COVID-19. So we uh, take care of so all the physicians, everybody who enters into the ICU into the regular ward should be fully protected. And uh, the mild patient treated in uh, uh, a different place and a very severe patient like, you know, the patient that needs to ICU individually, one patient to one ICU. And uh, all the physicians, all these, um, uh, the nurses are fully protected. And so far, so we have uh, seven, 1,700 physicians in Wuhan. So they are the physicians from Shanghai, they went to Wuhan. And also around, roughly around 50, 60 physicians in the Shanghai in the special hospital, none of them got infected. So I think the protection, isolation protection is very important. That's, that's very um, good since in Italy, we're having one in 10 people, uh, 10 uh, healthcare provider is affected. So that's really good. So um, have you seen co-infection with the COVID uh, patients uh, with other uh, viral infection like influenza or, or uh, coronavirus? Yeah, uh, yes. You know, we find, you know, uh, the influenza B, uh, you know, has been uh, co-infected in some of the patients. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, influenza A and the influenza B. But also some other, you know, um, uh, virus, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, the renal virus and, uh, um, uh, some bacteria, uh, but at least stage, you know, the bacterial infection is another issue. You know, uh, roughly around, uh, you know, twenty percent, more than twenty percent, if they get intubated, more than twenty percent get uh, bacterial infection. So, how frequent is it that the patients have uh, other viral infections? If you can tell, uh, not very high, not very high. So, basically, you know, majority of the patients, once uh, when they receive the nasopharyngeal swab test. At the same time, they also receive, you know, the test for the influenza A and influenza B. I think it's a very low, very low proportion. Okay, well, that's good. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Sang. That was very uh, enlightening and, and uh, you know, good. Thank you for sharing the information with us. Uh, I would like to introduce our next discussion, which is the global pers perspective of the uh, COVID-19 in Hong Kong. And there will be three uh, presenters, um, Dr. Uh, David C.L. Lam, uh, which is a, who is currently a clinical associate professor in the Department of Medicine, University of Hong Kong. He is a respiratory physician uh, with a research commitment, translational research and clinical uh, trials. Um, and his uh, research lab uh, focuses on translational research in lung cancer and AIDS and uh, COPD, sorry. Uh, he is uh, currently in the International Lung Screening uh, Trial uh, Consortium uh, screen, uh, Steering uh, International uh, Lung Screening Study and Biomarker Research, and he also is the APSR uh, Secretary General. Um, next is Professor David uh, Xu uh, Jiang Hui. Uh, he is the Director of the Stanley Hu Center uh, for uh, Emerging Infections. Uh, infectious Diseases uh, Jockey Club uh, School of Public Health and uh, Primary Care Faculty of Medicine, CUHK. Uh, 
Uh, he is a chairman of the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics at CUHK and is a Stanley Hu Professor uh, of Respiratory Medicine, uh, Department of Medicine and Therapeutics at CUHK. And um, lastly, uh, Dr. Men Hu Li, uh, who is currently uh, president of the CHEST delegation, Hong Kong and uh, Macau. He is a consultant for the Department of Medicine, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital, Hong Kong. And he is also honorary uh, clinical associate professor uh, of uh, Li Ka Shing, uh, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Hong Kong and the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics at Chinese University uh, of Hong Kong. So here's the global perspective of COVID-19 in Hong Kong. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I can see my colleagues, uh, Dr. Li is on the screen. Um, actually, Professor Hui um, is trying hard to ring in, but um, he said he has a problem in um, hearing what we are saying uh, from the audio here. So uh, I'm glad that he's um, actually with us. Um, um, if um, without delay, can I start the uh, our presentation? First, with, um, I would like to take this uh, the few more minutes to show you um, the COVID-19 situation in uh, Hong Kong. Um, actually, we have the first case actually imported um, into Hong Kong when uh, one of the residents in Wuhan in China arrived in Hong Kong. And um, that first patient was actually referred and managed at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hong Kong. And actually you can see from the graph, indeed, um, we have been having a quite low number of cases confirmed in Hong Kong over the past two months until in the recent one, two weeks that you can see on the right hand, right hand side of the slides that um, the cases actually um, climbed up very quickly in the recent um, two weeks as a result of um, people uh, returning from overseas. And um, uh, actually you can see from the uh, numbers we have listed, um, uh, actually in these two days, the numbers of confirmed cases has climbed up to more than 500. And uh, most of them has got travel history. So um, uh, actually they're uh, bringing in uh, from overseas those um, cases. And um, fortunately, only four of them died and um, a significant proportion of them, more than 100, got recovered and discharged. And um, actually 21 of them were actually ever in a critical or serious condition. And um, interestingly, we have a about um, slightly less than one tenth of the case being asymptomatic cases. Next, can I have the next slide, please? Yes, um, we will say over our experience in Hong Kong, we found that these cases have got a short incubation period, but at the same time, they could carry a high viral load. And um, there's the cases, the confirmed cases, a lot of them got long virus shedding period. And uh, also, and also um, the, um, there is, um, we found that there could be rapid person-to-person -person transmission, and uh, some cases could indeed be asymptomatic or only have very mild symptomatic um, at the beginning. And um, over our experience in Hong Kong, we noted that indeed um, lots of the cases comes from what we call clusters. Initially, we have the clues cluster from the diamond clues, and then locally, we have found some family uh, confirmed cases from family gathering, just like those patients um, within the same family gathering sharing hot pots. And um, some clusters were identified from um, temple attendants that they go to. Um, um, worship and um, at the weekend and gathered together and then got the um, diagnosis and recently we have uh, some clusters coming up um, that have um, popped attendance and also um, the music blends player um, actually inside the, the pub 
And uh, interestingly, um, in two of the confirmed patients, we also tested their dogs and um, they were tested positive. Next, please. And um, the cases that we have seen are mostly mild and um, they have very mild respiratory symptoms and fever and some of them even asymptomatic. And um, the chest X-ray and CT scans, as you can see from the slides here, initially could be quite clear or very subtle non-specific mnemonic changes. And um, fortunately, a lot of them recovered um, quite well. Uh, next, please. So um, the um, the viral load actually detected in um, could be detected in asymptomatic patient, and indeed the um, viral load and shedding of uh, confirmed cases um, for those asymptomatic ones could be quite similar to those patients who are symptomatic. Next, please. And um, over here in Hong Kong, we mainly use the triple therapy to treat the patients that consist of the protease inhibitor, lopinavir, and also the ritonavir, together with um, ribavirin. And um, we have also tried the interferon beta-1 beta if the illness onset um, is actually before seven days of the um, viral shredding. And um, a randomized controlled trial comparing triple therapy and two of the agents inside the triple therapy had been completed. We are waiting for the results locally. And we understand that remdesivir is actually in clinical trial. And um, uh, we have considered hydroxychloroquine, but it's not in routine use. And uh, probably we believe that um, it is of um, immunomodulatory effects, although it's not of a significant uh, uh, antiviral action in the South. Next, please. And um, so the measures we have adopted in Hong Kong is mainly a containment one. And we have what we have done here over the past two months is actually tried our best to rapidly isolate the suspected or confirmed cases with quarantine close contact. And we uh, have canceled mass gathering events over the past two months. We have closed all the schools and uh, we all try to work from home if possible. And we wear surgical masks in a crowded area. Uh, plus, very importantly, not only mask wearing, but also hand hygiene. And uh, we have also quarantines, returnees from overseas, especially Princess Cruise, the patient, uh, and actually some citizens from um, entering from mainland China, especially those from the Wuhan uh, province and also Europe and also North America. Uh, next, please. So from our experience, what we would suggest is that many things could be done at different levels in the society and um, especially at a community level or at the society level or the government level, we would try to control and restrict traffic to and from the high incident area. And um, we try to rapidly identify and confirm cases. And uh, we ha have to adopt a very strict containment and quarantine strategy and to ensure adequate and transparent uh, uh, communications to keep citizens informed of the current situation. We support medical and healthcare professionals and try to support adequate resource allocation to relevant healthcare sectors and their collaborators. And for all the healthcare professional, um, we advise universal precaution because it's highly infectious and try to reduce elective clinical procedures as well as admissions to the hospital. And uh, we use appropriate personal uh, protective equipment for patients, especially those who are undergoing aerosol generating procedures like bronchoscopy and um, also intubation and also taking nasopharyngeal swaps for the diagnosis. And um, at personal levels, we stress the importance of um, using surgical face masks together with um, proper hand hygiene and practice social distancing and um, try to avoid travel and gathering. And um, at a personal level, very important to seek early medical attention in case of respiratory symptoms and fever. So um, that's uh, our share of experience at the moment. And uh, we 
Dr. Lee, and, and I'm not sure if Professor Hui is able to rein in at the moment, but um, Dr. Dr. Lee on the screen and I will be trying help to um, entertain any questions if there are. Well, thank you so much. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Um, and for all of the speakers, there are really amazingly good questions that have been coming up online that I think we'll have to work on providing answers to those in the next few days. So we just had a couple questions. So the first was, and you really went over very nicely uh, your prevention strategies. So we were interested in, in maybe expanding a little bit more on screening at the hospital. Is it symptom-based? Is it strictly based on contacts? And to what extent have you extended um, your testing algorithms? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Lee, would you? Like to yes. provide some. Um, um, actually, uh, the um, lab, um, testing has been uh, ex extend, uh, extended. Uh, we have um, uh, very um, now we have a very enhanced laboratory um, surveillance uh, testing for uh, the case. Uh, apart from those um, uh, suspect for um, COVID uh, nineteen cases. Uh, actually, uh, all patients uh, who have uh, community acquired pneumonia will also be screened. And also, if um, the um, um, clinicians have uh, any suspicion, like um, the patient have unexplained fever, diarrhea, etc., um, they will also check. So I think uh, we uh, we did treasure a lot about the laboratory support uh, of the hospitals in Hong Kong. Uh, in fact, they are doing about uh, four to five rounds of uh, testing per day. Um, so the turnaround time of the uh, results is around about four to five hours so that uh, we can have the results. I think this is really important for us because um, for, uh, for those uh, patients who are um, put in the isolation uh, facilities, if we can have the results early, then we can discharge those patients. Then, so we, we need a very uh, rapid uh, turnover uh, of the cases in order to, um, to save uh, the isolation uh, facilities uh, because uh, we'll be, um, uh, uh, um, uh, at the moment, it's near our uh, capacity. So we, we need to uh, be uh, 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 cautiously used. Uh, apart from that, uh, recently we have uh, opened up um, new testing centers. Uh, there are two testing centers in um, near the airport. One is an exhibition center near the airport, another is a relatively small hospital near the airport. So the returnees uh, at the airport, they will go to these two centers um, if they have symptoms. And then they will uh, do the tests immediately and then wait for the results uh, at the two centers. If they are, um, the tests are negative, um, they can return to their home for home quarantine for the uh, subsequent two weeks. I think this is very good because uh, if uh, without these two centers, um, these uh, uh, pay, uh, these uh, uh, returnees will uh, will be admitted to hospitals because they have uh, returned from overseas and have symptoms. Now they will do the tests in these two centers. Um, so and then wait for the results. And uh, actually, many of uh, these uh, test negative can go back to uh, uh, to their home and then no need to go to the hospital. So uh, in, so is I uh, think in, in way is uh, also good to us. And also um, lately, uh, many um, A and E department uh, of the hospital in Hong Kong they are also doing the tests instead of admitting to the patient, uh, admitting to the medical wards, they do the test in the A and E department. And then they have, uh, um, they, um, they build some, some of the hospital actually build some tent so that the patient uh, will wait uh, inside the tent for the results. Again, um, the patient, uh, because they are relatively mild, mild symptoms, so they can afford to wait for the result for a few hours in the tent. If the results are negative, they are also allowed to go home and then continue the quarantine practice. Yeah, so I think uh, that can uh, uh, relieve uh, us a lot because uh, 
we we don't need uh, to uh, be very uh, the the isolation facilities will not be uh, too overcrowded. I think the um, the laboratory support to us uh, is um, very important for us. Thank you. And maybe on oh, the other end of the spectrum, sorry, I know David, my, I, oh, sorry. sorry, David, may mm -hmm. I just interrupt? Um, mm -hmm. I've I got a message from Professor David Ho that he oh. is actually online. Just um, although. He, he may not be able to show us the screen at the moment. Um, can I see if a Professor Hui is also online? If he can give us a message, hi, to see if he has any comment and uh -huh. any supplement. Hi, Professor Hui. I, I would, sorry, I would say yes. I was just seeing if Christina or Nicole, if oh. we can. Um, open up his. Um, open up his. Hi. It appears as his like that he's connected to audio, so I'm not sure what the problem is. He he just messaged me and say he can hear. Okay. Um, is he on mute? He's not. Let me try to ask him again, but uh, let's proceed on with the question, please. Okay. Um, so the other question is sort of the other end of the spectrum, which really, I think people are really concerned about the length of stay in our hospitalized patients, in the sense that um, patients who are no longer in need of critical care may require lengthy treatment and observation, which would take up beds. And we're wondering kind of what your experience and observations have been and how long patients needed to remain hospitalized? Uh, yes, uh, we face a similar issue. Uh, even the patient become asymptomatic, uh, the patient still need to keep in isolation because they, um, the, uh, the respiratory sample continue to uh, be PCL positive. So we cannot um, discharge the patient based on the criteria. So I think we also uh, have this problem. And, uh, and uh, actually um, uh, uh, about a third actually have been uh, more than two weeks or um, 20 days, et cetera. They are totally fine, but just uh, wait for the uh, laboratory <laughs> results criteria to be uh, met. And actually they are, they're in Hong Kong, we are looking into, into this issue and um, uh, we are thinking of uh, um, doing some um, viral culture, uh, but this is not routinely done, but just uh, for uh, studying whether for those with a very low uh, level of um, uh, viral load, actually uh, whether the, um, the virus are viable or not. Um, so I think it's, um, I think it's, uh, we also face this issue. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, really. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can I comment? Can mm -hmm. I comment on um, young sir? In, yes. in Korea, uh, for those kind of situation, we have some of the local government have set up what's called community treatment centers. So they would discharge the patient from the hospital and segregate uh, and uh, put the patients in, in these uh, buildings where, where they will be kept uh, kept away from the society until they become negative on PCR. Hmm. That's, that's how they try to solve the problem. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, well, fantastic. And, and as I mentioned, there are an, an increasing array of really, really cool questions coming up. So we'll work on those once we're done. So um, our next speaker will provide a perspective from Singapore. And this is Dr. Sirhan Pua. And he is currently a respiratory consultant and intensivist in the Tan Tok Seng Hospital in Singapore. He is the program director for the National Health Group. He's respiratory medicine residency program and the acting clinical director for the respiratory therapy services. And he's worked in the intensive care unit and the National Center for Infectious Diseases of Singapore during the outbreak and is currently part of the outbreak training committee for doctors going into the outbreak ICU. And so his presentation will be on global perspectives on COVID-19, the Singapore experience. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. And uh, the, so it is, it's 
really a good opportunity for me to share what uh, we have experienced so far and hopefully we can exchange ideas at the end of this. So first of all, I've, I've gotten quite a lot of questions where Singapore is. I just want to show you that it's a really tiny dot just below Malaysia. And uh, it's, it's a small island, but within this island itself, we house about eight uh, government hospitals as it is. And because we are a little hub and we do a lot of international travelers, we actually saw our first patient on the 23rd of January 2020. And as you can see from the graph on the right, most of the, it was initially quite a slow rise, but over the last uh, two to three weeks, you see an up, a very sharp increase to the amount of positive patients that we have received. And this is uh, partially because the government has been actively trying to bring back citizens from all over the world <coughs> back to Singapore so that they can uh, treat them as well and you know contain them within the country. So all these are mainly from travelers and uh, they are at the, the numbers are ever increasing as well. So as mentioned in Singapore itself, we have eight uh, government hospitals in total. Um, this is not included, inclusive of all the other private hospitals that are surrounding the island. And the main center that has been packed to deal with the COVID situation is the National Center for Infectious Diseases. This hospital uh, is actually quite new. It was built roughly in 2000 and uh, it, complete, it, it was completed a building in 2018. And this is linked to the hospital that I'm working in, in Tan Tok Seng Hospital. So we actually do cross uh, and we actually help out, uh, help out the wards over there during peacetime. So this hospital can house about 330 beds during peacetime and it has uh, since expanded to 586 beds. Uh, the ICU in the National Centre itself can house about 38 beds, uh, but uh, if we were to uh, use the beds in Tan Tosing, we can go up to about 90 ICU beds. The whole country can take up about 250 ICU beds in total. I think the challenges so far, I think, is what everybody has been experiencing. Uh, we are having issues with resources and manpower. And this is because uh, the doctors and all the staff, the allied health and all, are all kind of locked within their own hospitals. We are not allowed to cross hospitals at all so that just in case uh, we don't want to cross infect other people from other hospitals. Of course, bed capacity is always limited. And because of that, what happens is that uh, because of the sharp increase in patients that we are seeing now, the ambulances have been told to be redirected and uh, all the uh, all the uh, green and yellow cases, as we label them, have been redirected to the other hospitals as well. Um, so the private hospitals have been quite nice. Uh, they have been uh, helping us out and all the well patients with COVID positive swaps have been sent there to wait, for, wait recovery as well. Uh, I guess as an um, educator point of view, the training of the junior doctors and uh, medical students, uh, I think, uh, took a really big hit. A, uh, most of our junior doctors are part of the residency program, and I think a lot of their rotations have been interrupted because of the outbreak situation. And of course, uh, teaching sessions have also been cut down dramatically. We are also going to face an issue with our house, uh, because the medical students who are in year five now can't sit for their exams. So they are thinking of ways of how to graduate these medical students so that they can join the workforce as house officers of interns uh, middle of the year. I think these are a few of the challenges that we have been facing so far. Uh, what, are, what are our current state? We actually, uh, at, as of yesterday, we have a total of 732 positive cases, and out of which 40 have received invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, we have, thankfully have only had two deaths since the start of the outbreak, and this is our, these are our mortality rates at 0.3% in totality. But if you were to just look at the amount of patients that come into ICU, it's about 5%. And this is nationwide. Uh, at the beginning, at, up, to, up to the end of February, we managed to collect some data prospectively. And uh, we are continuing that prospective data collection. But uh, we have analyzed those data. And uh, just to share with everybody, what we have done is that we have analyzed 60 PCR positive patients, out of which 50 did not come into ICU and 10 got intubated. And just like data all around the world, you can see what significance that patients that end up in ICU being intubated tend to be on the older side. Uh, although ours is, uh, the median age is about 52, well, I think what's been published in China is about the age of 65, uh, tend to be more male predominant, although that's not significant. 
And why did I put down the ethnicity here is because Singapore is actually a multicultural uh, society where about 75% of them are from the Chinese ethnicity. Uh, the other 15% is the Malay ethnicity and about the, the remaining 10% is about from the Indian ethnicity. Um, the co although most of them have some form of comorbidities, but in this analysis, we didn't find any significance between the both of them. I think it's because the numbers are still pretty small here. So the ICU patients, interesting. so what we found was that when we actually analyzed the well patients versus the ICU patients, we found that the ICU patients tend to complain of dyspnea a lot more. Their temperatures tend to be higher and they tend to be tachycardic, more than about 110. The respiratory rate tend to be higher as well, more than 18. And when we look at the blood analysis, interestingly, what we found was that if you have a neutrophil count of more than four, it really correlates with the need of invasive mechanical ventilation. And this is a direct opposite from what we notice from our well patients. So our well patients tend to be on the lower side. So if you have fever, uh, URTI symptoms, history of travel, and you are, you tend to be COVID positive if your nutritive counts tends to be lower. I think the cutoff number is at 2.6. And just like all around the world, profound lymphopenia is seen uh, with raised LDH. And we did the neutrophil and lymphocyte ratio, it tends to be higher the LDH and lymphocyte ratio tends to be higher as well. I think mm. what I wanted to highlight is that the CRP levels, the C-reactive protein levels are raised in patients with, uh, that come in with us with, uh, that requires invasive mechanical ventilation. We found that a cutoff of 68 had an OROC at uh, 0 0.92, which is quite indicative. And almost every patient that came to us have some form of infiltrates in the chest X-ray on arrival. So I think some general observations to share. We found that a lot of times that the patients that come into the ICU had profound hypoxemia. And this degree of hypoxemia doesn't really match with the radiological changes. Uh, we do see the ground glass changes, which has which been widely reported, and occasional basal consolidation. Um, when you do the scans and you analyze the CD scans, they tend to be at the posterior part of the lungs as well. But it just, uh, you know, the, from the FiO2 requirements and the PIP requirements, that these patients uh, uh, require actually do not really match with the, the X-ray changes at all. But despite that, the driving pressures tend to be still low, less than 15, and the plateau pressures also usually don't really exceed 30 unless a secondary bacterial infection comes into play. Now, proning works, and proning really, really help with the PF ratios. Um, and interestingly, what we have found is some of the patients that recover from ICU, uh, we are reporting that some of them actually experience some autodeoxia. Uh, along with some platinum. Yeah. So um, uh, we are trying to, we are, we are submitting this as a manuscript to, to show some discussion and we suspect uh, because of the damage on the lungs, there's some, uh, some pulmonary shunting that's happening, especially when they sit up. So uh, as of yesterday, our invasive mechanical ventilation rates is about 5.5%. But since the symptom, from the symptom of onset to intubation, the median days is about 8.5 days. Uh, a lot of our patients do come in from admission itself and end up in the ICU within a day. And a lot of them is because they come in uh, uh, in a very ill state to the emergency department. Uh, prior to that, they probably would have visited two to three general practitioners or you know the polyclinics or the doctors just to receive treatment before coming to us. Uh, Apache scores uh, and median SOFA scores are pretty similar to the, other, the rest of the world, which is about 19 and 8 respectively. The PF ratios prior to intubation is about 104, but post intubation about 168. About 50% of our ICU patients receive paralysis, and about 20% receive prone ventilation. Uh, they tend to be tend to be a single organ. They tend to remain a single organ damage, but later on during their stay, they tend to do all the other complications. We notice only about 10% of them require CRRT. <clears throat> And um, if they stay long enough in the ICU, they, they do get the nosocomial infections. Uh, we had one candidemia, uh, a couple of VAPs, the Klebsiella. Uh, one of the, our patients actually developed uh, deep vein thrombosis, uh, and uh, one of them actually developed quite significant GI bleed requiring scopes and blood transfusion. I think only two so far required ECMO. Uh, one of it VV and the other one required a VA ECMO after a PA arrest. Uh, Unfortunately, the VV ECMO passed away, and uh, the one that received the VA ECMO is currently recovering in one of the government hospitals. Uh, out of all the patients that entered the ICU, three required tracheostomy, two uh, had open tracheostomy in the OT, one had a bedside tracheostomy. 
as I mentioned at earlier on, we, we experienced two deaths so far. I think just to summarize the ICU perspective in Singapore, we notice that patients that do require invasive mechanical ventilation tend to have some form of fever, tend to have higher temperatures, tend to be more breathless with increased raised, uh, respiratory rates, tachycardic, poor oxygen saturations. Uh, the CRP levels are, are probably the one of the main things that they, they may require some form of uh, closer monitoring. Profound lymphopenia with an increase in neutrophil counts, and of course, presence of X-ray changes. And again, just to share, the lung mechanics, they tend to have low plateau pressures and low driving pressures despite the high FiO2 and PEEP requirements. And they do respond to prone ventilation really well. And we're actually thinking of prone ventilating patients earlier on. And I know some of my colleagues have actually uh, decided to prone patients when they're not ventilated. And uh, uh, they just require some supplemental oxygen in the wards and they're already get, getting them to prone early on. Um, we are yet to see whether that actually really helps. Uh, of course, uh, for for the rest of the world, just watch for this photodeoxia because uh, a lot of times this will hamper rehabilitation and, and physiotherapy post ICU care. And all they need is just some supplemental oxygen and some supine rest, and then the oxygen will actually tend to pick up. Uh, with that, I'd like to end my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Uh, Hua. And um, I have a couple of questions, or a little bit more than a couple. Uh, so one of them you actually already addressed about the ventilator uh, management. Uh, from the management perspective, what's your experience with uh, permissive hypercapnia, proning, and ECMO? So it's yeah, that's that you don't need to readdress it. Yeah, I see. <clears throat> so I think what we found is that then. Uh, that because prone works really well, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, is probably one of the ways that we can actually advise people to, to, to avoid ECMO, especially if you do intubate them early and if you prone them early. I think that's one of the reasons why our ECMO rates have been on the lower side. So um, ECMO, again, our experience is just two, so it's not that many. And uh, with regards to permissive hypercapnia, a lot of the patients at the beginning suffer from type 1 respiratory failure. But I think towards the later part when the lungs becomes a lot more fibrotic, that's when the CO2 starts to come up. <clears throat> right. Do you have experience with inhaled nitric oxide in these patients' population? Uh, no, and uh, we've, we've, we've not used it, but I think there are a couple of reports that have been uh, out in, uh, that just been published and says that it, I don't think it really did help very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Pua. We appreciate your presentation. Uh, so I would like to introduce our uh, last perspective uh, for this webinar, uh, Professor uh, Soji Young from South Korea. Uh, professor Young is a professor and uh, chair um, of Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine of Samsung Medical uh, Center uh, at uh, Sung uh, Q uh, Huan University School of Medicine. Uh, professor Young is the president of the Korean Study Group on Rapid Response System, uh, President of a Korean Study Group on ICU Rehabilitation, and Vice President uh, of the Korean Society of Critical Care Medicine, and is a Fellow of the uh, American College of Critical Care. So, uh, Dr. Um, Young, please go ahead. Hi, actually my name is uh, Dr. So. My G, G. Young is my first name. And so is my last name. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's uh, that's okay. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Mm. Okay. Uh, I will talk on the uh, South Korean experience. Actually, our experience began quite early, as our first patient was diagnosed while entering Korea. She was a Chinese uh, uh, national. She was entering the airport and she was diagnosed uh, at the stop, check, stop uh, checkpoint at the airport on January 20th. Then we had a couple of cases, mostly from, uh, from China. Then, then there was a big, big increase in, in uh, mid to end of, end of February, as you can see. Now the cases seems to be leveling. And this is the uh, number of patients by day. As you can see, it went up uh, 
to close to uh, 1,900, over 900 patients. Then we are leveling at about hovering around 100 patients per day these days, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. But these, uh, a lot of cases was from the one, uh, one religious cult, religious cult sex, sect called Shincheonji. And uh, around 60% um, of our cases are related to this religious sect. And uh, the, many of the patients are concentrated in one area. So around 80% of the cases are from the Daegu and Gyeongbuk area. And, and uh, in other areas are, are, are not that contributing to much to the number of patients. But we are not out of the woods yet. As you can see for Seoul and surrounding Gyeonggi area, the number of patients are slowly, slowly accumulating. As you can see, there's no uh, bending of the curve yet. So we are uh, still uh, in uh, a high alert mode in Korea. So why was uh, rel Korea relatively successful in containing the virus so far while avoiding total shutdown of the society? I think one of the experience that helped was was the experience in 2015 that we had with Middle East respiratory syndrome epidemic. For the general public, there is a there was a widespread awareness of dangers of coronavirus infection. For healthcare centers, it was a very good uh, moment for uh, to make those protocols. Uh, about this kind of uh, epidemics. So before 2015, none of the hospitals had any protocols for these kind of things. But after 2015, most had protocols already set up for isolation of suspect, suspected patients and testing. And for government agencies, there was, uh, after the 2015, there's uh, improved communication on this kind of stuff, improved manpower, and the people who are leading the fight against the, the virus currently had a very first-hand experience in 2015, so that will also help. Also, we use uh, a lot of technology in tracing contacts, tracking visitors, and notifying healthcare workers about heightened risk. For example, uh, we would use surveillance camera, cameras and G GPS data of phones and we would send out text messages of confirmed patients' whereabouts to, to the citizens who live near that area. And, and we, for, for visitors coming into the country, they have to uh, download application for smartphones to, so the government can check their, their, uh, their health and their whereabouts of, of them. And uh, uh, our we have a one insurance system, which is the government in our country, one, one insurance, and they have this, this system called drug utilization review system where, where we can check what drugs the patient was on before they came into our hospital. But the government, uh, after this episode, uh, uh, decided to include travel history in the review system so when a patient comes in to our hospital, we can check where he has been in. Uh, for example, if he was he he was he been traveling to Italy or U.S. or China, we will be very on high alert. Also, uh, we were very successful in minimizing spread from asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic patients. Excuse me. Uh, uh, okay, so because we had very aggressive early, early testing of contacts and <laughs> at-risk population, even if they were asymptomatic. And uh, there is a universal wearing of face masks. I think the, uh, one of the uh, panels alluded to earlier, I think that's, that was really helpful in containing the spread from these asymptomatic patients. This is the uh, entrance of our, of our hospital, Samsung Medical Center. 
everyone who comes into the hospital has their body temperature checked and their travel history checked and asked if they have respiratory symptoms. And if they have respiratory symptoms or suspect uh, been in near uh, these uh, travel history, they will be not allowed to enter the hospital and would go to a screening center to, to be tested for coronavirus. This is our ER. So uh, when a per patient comes into the ER, we would try triage him in a separate building in front of the ER. And if it's, if it's a suspect of a coronavirus, he would go to, if it's not suspected, he would come into the ER. But if it's suspected, he would go to this uh, uh, isolation rooms to be examined and be tested. This is the entrance and there's a relative pressure rooms in there. And this is the facility of the room. And also uh, we clear the parking space where we would set up a screening center for uh, people who, be, who to get tested. If they have uh, symptoms or they have a fever, they will, the hospital will send them to here uh, to get tested before they can come into the hospital. This is the uh, drug utilization review system the, of government insurance agency. And if we, this is our EMR, the picture of our EMR. And if we click here, the, the, the pop-up, there will be a pop-up screen to, to tell us if, where he's been, if he's been traveling. We have, uh, from early on, we had a very big capacity for testing and, and the peak, at the peak level, we tested around 20,000 uh, tests per day as a nation. And you can see the, the positive rates were very low. Uh, at most, it was around uh, uh, three, three or 4%. Uh, we were very innovative in testing. As you can see, it's one of the drive-through uh, testing centers. I think the, some US centers have this kind of uh, setup, but uh, we were the first country to have, have this kind of uh, testing system, which minimize contact between the, the testee and the testers. Also, now we have what's called walkthrough testing centers. This is a, a, a testing center at the airport where people who come from the Europe, Europe area ha have to go through mm -hmm. mandatory testing and, and get a confirmed negative result before they can leave, leave a, a, a facility. Also, I uh, I think the ma mask Koreans are very very uh, uh, conscientious about wearing masks as a society, and I think uh, there's a although there's no evidence that it protects, I, but there's an essential distinction between absence of evidence and evidence of absence. And since the COVID-19 could be transmitted before symptom onset community transmission might be reduced if everyone, including people who have been infected or are asymptomatic and contagious wear masks. And I, I, the, the, this uh, uh, comment on the Lancet uh, illustrated the opinion of the Oxford group, but I think this really helped to contain the spread of the virus. Uh, many challenges, uh, there. Uh, one is the separating COVID-19 patients from other patients. Well, we did this with early aggressive testing. And we had in, in my hospital, there was a regular meeting of those people involved in care. Uh, so we set up approaches for how to handle people who have fever or respiratory symptoms but need urgent care. For example, if a patient is a cesarean section for delivery and he has, she has a fever, how would handle that? Uh, we have all the protocols set up for those things. And we have uh, separate rooms put aside for suspected patients. 
pathways for common procedures were uh, carefully thought out before. Also, uh, the handling of fear among uh, medical people, uh, doctors and nurses can be very difficult sometimes. So uh, we have to educate about them and, and educate them on donning and doffing of our personal protection equipment. And, and there's problems of triage of uh, people who, who needs uh, close observation from uh, those who may not need not need those close observations. And in early phase of our outbreak, we some of the people died while awaiting to get admitted to the hospital. And, and to avoid those kind of tragedy, uh, if you have a big surge in patient numbers, uh, you have to have think through how to separate those are people with very low risk of a uh, bad outcome and people who has a high risk of a bad outcome. And as I alluded to before, uh, some of the local governments have put on so-called community treatment centers. Some use them to house low risk patients from the, from the beginning and some use it as a, uh, 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 as a, uh, uh, people who uh, discharge who are discharged and very very well but they're still positive PCR and uh, to house them so I think the early detection is the key for community to reduce spread from people with no or mild symptoms for hospitals to reduce spread to uh, healthcare workers and other vulnerable patients and and triage system is uh, you have to think through that and uh, for people who are admitted uh, you close observation of, of people who start to desaturate and you should have the pathways thought out that so that critically patients who do not have coronavirus does not suffer uh, thank you for your attention thank you very much thank you sorry i was on mute um one second well that was really a um fantastic perspective um i think we have two questions and then we can wrap up from there so the first question was um and you you touched on this already but practical strategies for preparing the medical center for a surge and um for example stopping all elective procedures proactively reducing icu capacity sort of how did you think about a potential surge? Uh, actually, my hospital is in Seoul area, so we didn't, we don't, we didn't have that surge of patients that uh, the people at Daegu uh, area had. Uh, but we, um, uh, I think the, we, we have to cancel the elective patients and discharge patients who are minimally ill so we can save save beds for the, the covid patients and also uh, uh maybe uh, prepare prepare the icus so that we can ventilate as many people as we can and also educate the, the uh, our uh healthcare workers on the uh personal protective equipment and and I think that's the key. And then um, one one final question, and certainly this might be for all of you, is, is sort of how do you recommend supporting physicians at your medical center? Have you done shorter shifts? And what kind of strategies have you employed to reduce uh, burnout and, and fear, I think, as you had mentioned? Uh, for for us the the number of patients that we had so far in our in our facility is only about around six during the whole time so uh we would uh give the give them uh many um, many extra things for example we would give them uh food uh, a place to stay in the hospital where they can rest because they were 
some of the uh, personnel don't want to go home because they think they might infect their loved ones. So we would we provide uh, a place to stay for them and provide them food. And after they are uh, they are finished working with the uh, COVID-19 positive patient, we give them one week off, uh, paid free time. But because that's that's possible because we didn't have that many patients so far. But uh, if we have that, uh, we might need to recruit more uh, ward nurses to work work uh, in our ICUs and. And doctors who are not really uh, uh, who does not work in the ICUs regularly, we might have to educate them and bring them into the care also. But fortunately, we have not been in that situation so far in our hospital. Well, let me. We're a little bit over, but I really appreciate everybody's comments and really on behalf of the participants, the ATS, the APSR. I would like to thank all of tonight's presenters for their perspectives, recommendations, and strategies. And I want to thank our participants for submitting what I think is an amazing array of questions, super interesting. Uh, we will work hard um, to perhaps collate those questions and get responses from our presenters. And a quick reminder to our participants to complete the evaluation so that we can identify future topics and continue to improve our series. Um, and finally, I invite all of you to join us for future presentations of this webinar. I wish you all health and safety during this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think mine and Samia's thoughts are with you all. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very good. Thank you. 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 Thank